اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعجل فرجهم ولعن أعداءهم وقتلتهم ومخالفهم وظالميهم أجمعين آمين Dear viewers of Imam Hussein TV, I would like to start by expressing my deep condolences to His Eminence and His Majesty, the Imam of our time, Sahib al Amru al Zaman, on the, e on the night of the martyrdom of our seventh Imam, Musa ibn Jafar. May divine blessings be upon him and his father. And secondly, I would like to express my condolences to the Shia community at large around the world. And uh, as for myself, I would like to thank every single Shia uh, individual around the world who tried to commemorate the martyrdom of Musa ibn Jafar and al Qadim by any means possible. We were witness to great uh, rituals uh, in Qadimin being held by people from all around Iraq. And I'm certain that the same rituals and morning sessions were held around the world. So may that be some uh, relief to the agony and anguish of our Imam. And may Allah bring forward and hasten his reappearance. Amin. Well, uh, on such a night, um, I'm privileged to be joined by His Eminence, Sheikh Faini. Uh, uh, we're going to have, uh, inshallah, uh, an in-depth discussion of around the character of Imam Qadim alayhi salam and uh, his prominence in the world of Islam in large some of the miracles that we have uh, testimony of from not only the Muslims but also non-Muslims and different sects and some other topics so uh, stay with us, and it is my sincere hope that this discussion will benefit you and add to your knowledge of our wronged Imam, Musa ibn Jaffa, who suffered and sacrificed uh, his life for the sake of the guidance of the Shia. And he took it upon himself to be tortured so that the Shia would be saved and redeemed. Assalamu alaikum, Shaykhuna. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. It is truly a privilege to have you on this program. And I hope that uh, I can be uh, part of this great discussion with you and that our viewers will uh, benefit the most from our discussion and that it will be accepted uh, by Allah the Almighty and Ahlul Bayt alayhim salatu wa salam. Inshallah. So uh, if you have any introductory words, uh, I would be very pleased if you talk to the viewers and then I'll present the first question and we can, you know, take it from there. Go from there, inshallah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. First of all, it's an honor to be here in the city of Karbala, Al-Muqaddasa with the beautiful view of the Haram of Abi Fadl Abbas السلام, and Imam Hussain السلام, There's really nothing dearer to the heart than that, um, than being in this, in this holy city during this most sacred of, of times, right? Towards the end of Rajab and the beginning of Sha'aban. These are just amazing time to be in Iraq, to be visiting the holy sites and to be discussing about these sacred personalities yes inshallah ta'ala Insha and today being one of those very important and very sacred days in our calendar yes well um so let's uh take it from here that uh 
Imam al kazim alayhi salam, he is uh, such a phenomenal character. I mean, uh, his grandeur is uh, obviously visible in the literature of hadith, uh, Shia. But uh, are there any references to him in other sects, uh, you know, Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, or any other sects, with regard to uh, his his position and his contributions to Islam as a whole? Absolutely, uh, Imam Al Qadim alayhi salam, and this is perhaps something that a lot of uh, that many Muslims forget, or maybe even some followers of the Madhab of Ahlul Bayt don't realize, which is that Imam Al Qadim was a universal figure. He was universally accepted as being the most learned of his time. If we go to the books of Rijal, which are the biographies of the narrators of Hadith, of other schools of thought, we will see that there is always praiseworthy statements about him. And in fact, in, in I believe in Zahabi, or in other books, it is stated that he was the most pious of his day. Atqa, right? It's a superlative word that, yeah. that there was nobody known to be more pious than him. That's a very profound statement because you think of the hundreds, if not thousands of Muslims of that generation that they could talk about. And then to use a statement that he is the most pious is something which is very important. And this is reflected in his life. We have to know that this is reflected in his life, that, that both his enemies and his friends recognize his piety. Exactly. So even the people who wanted to kill him or the people who loved him, nobody could debate about his godliness and his piety. So that is something that we read. We read, of course, that he is naturally trustworthy in his hadith. Na'udhu billah, I mean, to say otherwise, I mean, would be, would be a heresy. But um, he is found throughout the books of the Muslims, his biography. He's also known as a person who has done, performed miracles. Um, and we have in books like Hiliyat al and other books yes. um, of the other schools of thought, especially in Tasawwuf and Sufism, we have some narrations about his miracles. Now, whether these are, we accept all of these or not is, something, is a different story, but the point exactly. is that he is respected and venerated exactly. and considered to be among, if not the most learned and the most pious person of his generation. Yeah, speaking of the word uh, learned, uh, one of the epithets, if I'm not mistaken, that were used to uh, address the Imam or refer to the Imam uh, among the companions was Al-Alim. And we can see that uh, some of the narrations that when we just chase the uh, transition of the hadith and the chain of, uh, you know, the uh, authors, uh, we come to the word al-alim. So this actually kind of represents what you were talking about. So this is one of what we, this was one of his uh, mostly common used epithets. Maybe some for some period as a means of uh, taqiyya or, you know, not to uh, reveal his name, but uh, it could also be viewed as uh, an, epith an epithet that uh, characterized this person as being learned and well-versed and very, very knowledgeable. Well, absolutely. I mean, it is, um, it is, it goes without saying, really, when it comes to Imam al Qadim alayhi salam. And that is why we see that, for example, in Al Kafi, in Babul Aqal, in the chapter on Aqal, what is one of the most important conversations or discourses? It's the conversation between Al Imam al Qadim alayhi salam and Hisham ibn Hakam. The whole discussion about why Allah created the Aqal about the importance of the aql, about those who don't use their aql, meaning their intellect. Yes. It was Imam al Qadim alayhi salam, not that it was not done before him, but who emphasized so greatly on the use of the intellect that Allah has given us, as the intellect as being one of the greatest signs of Allah, uh, that Allah has created. Being which is, a hujjah. Yeah, 
it's, it's the proof that Allah has put within us, right? And this discourse between the seventh Imam السلام, and Hisham ibn Hakam is enshrined in our hadith. It has affected our theology. It has affected our philosophy. It has affected our way of thinking. It, 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 it forms, it, it almost forms the bedrock of how to show you understands the concept of aql mm -hmm. to a certain extent. Of course, there are yeah. so many other riwayats. Sheds light, light but, at least. And if you look at the commentaries on this, there are hundreds of pages written on this discourse between Imam al kadhim alayhi salam and Hisham ibn Hakam. And of course, the Imam has made many contributions. We can discuss this as time progresses, but this is one of them. And this, um, you know, it reiterates basically exactly. what you've mentioned about one of his epithets being al-alim or the scholar. Yeah, exactly. That's uh, very true. So uh, could we just uh, think of uh, another uh, contribution, major contribution uh, of Imam Kazim confronting many uh, emerging schools of thoughts at his time. Uh, Ismailiya, you know, and uh, Nawusiya, Fatahiya, and uh, of course the, uh, I could say the scholar, uh, uh, scholar courtiers actually, I would say, uh, but scholarly courtiers who associated with the Abbasids. And then these debates and these uh, dial uh, dialectical and uh, sort of ideological debates with them, uh, much of this is not known, as you co correctly mentioned, to even the followers of Ahl Bayt, to the Shia. I mean, uh, we, let's say the majority of the Shia just view the Imam as just being in prison and just, you know, uh, suffering a lot of torment and, uh, you know, torture inflicted by uh, the Abbasid so-called caliphs, in particular Harun al-Abbas made the wrath and curse of Allah be upon them all. But uh, this very important aspect of his lifetime, his scholarly and, and, and contribution to the world of Islam, the knowledge, the fountain of knowledge, actually, that he was, and he delivered to uh, his followers and Islam in large. This is uh, somehow maybe obscured by that, you know, other side of uh, his life, being in prison and all those uh, detain detentions and so on and so forth. So if you have uh, more comments on that, if you could just, just delve into this. Yeah, uh, sure. Absolutely. I mean, I think we should go back to that narration or that dialogue between the Imam and Hisham the Hakam because sure. I think there's so much that can come from here, right? That he begins that narration. I think one of the most important things here is the Imam is teaching us how to think. Mm -hmm. It's so deep, right? He, he, he's setting the foundations in so many other things we can discuss, but in telling us that there are two kinds of people. There are those who use their aql, and there are those who don't. So he praises the people of aql, and then he praises the people who don't use it, who we could say are Ahlul Jahl, the people of Jahl. Exactly. So he says about the first people, he quotes the ayah of Quran, about those that listen to the statement and follow the best of it. Right? Yastami'un al-qawl wa yatabi'un ahsana. Right? That they listen to it and they follow the best of it. Meaning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us the ability, he's given us the furqan, he has given us the criterion by which to differentiate between haq and batil. He's given us that criteria. And this is what he's telling Hisham. That if you understand who is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or, 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 or as you journey, as you're on that journey to discover the existence of Allah in your life, you will automatically realize who we are. Exactly. If you're looking for truth, you will automatically find it with us. Because there's something that is innate within us exactly. that attracts us towards the truth. So in other sense, we could say that Imam uh, combines our intellect with the divine guidance and leadership of Ahlul Bayt. 
And uh, we can't really do without both. We need to have both in order to stay on the right path. Of right. course, because the intellect is only formed through the wilaya of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad salawatullahi wa salamu alayhim ajma'in. Exactly. But, or rather what the Imam is saying is that that initial discovery of them in our exactly. life, before we follow their, sh their path, their sunnah, before we under go deeper into understanding their sayings, that the beginning of accepting who they are, to have them be a part of our life, a governing part of our life, is something that comes from within our intellect. That if we accept that God exists, and that we've been put on this earth for a purpose, and that we require a roadmap or guidance, Exactly. Then the wilaya of Ahlul Bayt and the wilaya of those that are most pure and most pious and most learned is an obvious need and need. requirement. It's, yeah. it's intellectual, right? Yeah. But then he says there's another group of people who don't search for the truth, who don't really care, right? They just follow what their fathers taught them. And they don't know whether their fathers were guided or whether their fathers were misguided, right? He quotes again cites the Qur'an, yeah, in this, Qur'an. In, to this yeah. effect, right? And he says that then Allah condemns and blames these people because they live a life on autopilot, an autopilot life. The Imam alayhi, is not looking for followers that live an autopilot life, that just follow whatever they hear. They don't think about it. Does it make sense? Does it not make sense? According to the criteria of Allah and Ahlul Bayt. Not they create their own criteria. Exactly. That's not what I'm saying, That's right? The point. But they have to understand what they believe. Why are they followers of Ahlul Bayt to begin with? Or the uruf or the customs that they're following or the practices that they have in their daily life. Where does it come from? Is it on the basis of aql? If it's on the basis of the intellect, then it has to be founded on a practice or a tradition that comes from the Qur'an and the Ahlul Bayt Not, so to speak, as people would say, from your pocket. Yeah, so it's not uh, like blind submission to some sort of tradition that has existed and then they say, okay, well, we just have to go along with that as the, you know, Qur'anic verse uh, speaks of this truth something to this effect that well uh, when you ask some people why are you doing this we say well we found our fathers doing that so we just go along with that and so this is absolutely against uh i could say uh decent uh intellectual uh thinking uh as you clearly mentioned so uh if i want if I, to just uh, paraphrase and summarize maybe what you said is that the uh, intellect that uh, Ahlul Bayt introduced to us is uh, a, a driver that can help us just get closer and closer to the light of Ahlul Bayt. And from there, they will just take us on this beautiful journey to understand more and discover more and, and, and come, arrive at the truth and then stick with it. That's the point, because we may sometimes arrive at the truth, but the conviction does not really come and join before you, you know, you, uh, you deep down really say, oh, okay, yeah, this is, you have faith in what you have arrived at as truth. Uh, please correct me. Yeah, if I, exactly. I and the interesting thing that we have to think about here, or one of the things is, Hisham ibn Hakam was who? Oh, he exactly. was a great theologian. He was yeah. a great follower of Ahlul Bayt, a great Shia. Yet even he needed this reminder from Imam al kadhim So who are we? Imam Salamullah Ali is not speaking to somebody off the street. Exactly. Imam is not speaking to an ordinary person. He's speaking to Hisham ibn Hakam, one of the most prominent companions of the Ahlul Bayt in terms yeah. of his knowledge and his theology and his understanding exactly. of the Imamah. If Hisham is being instructed about the aql and about the use of the intellect and the importance of the intellect, then naturally we should pay heed to this. And the general point is don't take anything for granted. Mm -hmm. Each and every one of us should have the spark of curiosity in our heart. 
the spark and the desire to want to know more, to want to learn more. That is the important thing for us to be on a journey. The Imam wants us to be on a journey because that is, the, that is using the aql that Allah has given us. Exactly. We are fulfilling the purpose of our existence and our creation, which is to use the intellect that Allah has given us to believe in Him and to live a life that's worthy of His taqwa. Right? What taqullah haqqa tuqatihi. Right? And have godliness and God consciousness with the right of that God consciousness. But reciting that verse on its own is not enough, is what the Imam is saying. This is not sufficient. Right? Many people have slogans. Yeah. Hollow slogans. Hollow slogans. But what do those words mean? Mm. And I truly believe, and I, I, I don't know why, but this hadith has just had such an effect on my life personally, in my journey as somebody that you know, likes to study and read about, about Islam and Madhab Ahlul Bayt, which is that without that spark of curiosity, none of us can go anywhere in terms of seeking knowledge. You have to, it comes from somewhere deep within you, right? And that should naturally lead us to the path. And then once, of course, we accept Allah's existence and we accept the madhab of Ahlul Bayt and the wilay of Ahlul Bayt, then we do taslim to them. Mm -hmm. Of course, complete taslim. And then our intellect becomes even further illuminated. Exactly. And it, be it, it grows in its luminosity because they are al mathul al-a'la. Right? They are that greatest example yeah. that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created. And that greatest example is that most luminous, most enlightened intellect. And this is one of the reasons why the Imam alayhi, is emphasizing so much on the use of our intellect in learning about our religion, investigating about our deen, sorting out the truth from the falsehood. Exactly. Well, uh, it's really been an interesting uh, discussion. And uh, this very particular point uh being curious about our religion and uh using our intellect to guide that curiosity and to become illuminated by the divine blessings of ahl bayt is uh i suppose a fundamental uh i can say springboard that can help us make a great departure and start a journey with Ahlul Bayt alayhim So uh, we're going just to have a short uh, break. And after the break, uh, it would be my pleasure to continue the discussion with you on uh, this topic and the further topics that come around. Inshallah. So um, uh, please stay tuned with us uh, after the short break that is delivered to you. Thank you for being with us uh, until this moment.
Salam alaikum. My warmest greetings to all of you viewers of Imam Hussein TV. And uh, please accept my condolences on the martyrdom of uh, Mulana Musabna Ja'far alayhi salatu wassalam. So as you know, uh, uh, we have the pleasure and honor of uh, having uh, Sheikh Lini with us on this program. And we'd like to follow the discussion on the topics that we started uh, before the break that you just witnessed. So, uh, Sheikh Hanab, we were uh, uh, discussing the different uh, aspects of uh, His Majesty, uh, the Imam, and uh, I, I like to use that phrase because he, I mean, Ahlul actually re deserve uh, the real, uh, that sort of uh, majestical position. Anyway, uh, so uh, his, his, his contribution to his scholarly contribution and his shedding light on the fact that we need to use our intellect uh, in order to be guided and in order to uh, embark on a journey of seeking the truth uh, perpetually. Of course, that is uh, to the extent of our lifetime uh, and maybe here in the hereafter. <laughs> uh, but uh, there are very interesting uh, and perhaps some of them uh, curious aspects and uh, mm, unique aspects of uh, the lifetime of Imam Qadr that we could also explore, such as the historical, let's say, setting of uh, his imamate and uh, the political circumstances, the uh, theological schools that uh, were uh, emerging and gaining roots in his lifetime and how he confronted these and um, perhaps if we have time the element of uh, I think the tenet an element of uh, taqiyya or this kind of like uh, protective I could say uh, precaution as uh, the translation goes I suppose uh, and how he actually the Imam tactfully used this in order to uh, fulfill his mission so, if you please uh, continue on these. Yes, so um, we have to understand that the Imams, Imamat really began at the heyday of the Abbasid Empire. At a time in which the Abbasids, especially Harun, sought to crush any dissent against him. And this social or political climate you know, contributes to our understanding of why the Imam was treated in the way that he was treated. Not to mention that of his, you know, the hatred of Harun and those like him towards the Ahlul Bayt. That's one thing, because obviously the the Abbasids wanted to promote their Khilafah. They wanted to promote their line of succession, not the line of succession of the children of Sayyidah Zahra alayha. That's one thing. The second thing was they were brutal towards everybody. I mean, look at what they did to the Umayyads. I mean. I mean, we don't have any sadness for the Umayyads, but how they came into power and basically killed off all of the yeah. Umayyads, they knew very well that the descendants of Sayyidah Zahra and particularly Imam Al-Kadhim alayhi salam was an open enemy to them. In this, not that he proclaimed himself to be an enemy, but the very fact that his existence mm -hmm. as an Imam as the hujjah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is believed to be the hujjah by many people, the proof of Allah, was an existential threat to the Abbasid Caliphate. At least that was the pretense or the pretext that was used to imprison the Imam. And this would continue for a very long time. Now the period of Ma'amun was just a fatra, uh, was just a period of relief we call it relief, Let's we call, call it, it just maybe, maybe a, a kind a change of, of strategy. A period of yeah. a change of strategy, strategy yeah, not yeah. relief, but an out, you know, a, uh, a zahir relief, shall exactly. we say. Not what, you know, a kind of exterior relief, not, yes. from, the, not from inside. But who was a son, obviously, of, of, of son of Harun. Mm. And what transpired during his time was essentially the, the, the strategy of maximum pressure. 
kind of like what the arrogant powers would do today when they don't like a specific nation or someone that is independent you apply maximum pressure that to try to crush your opponent crush their hopes crush their dreams crush everything and that was the intention behind him being captured in the city of medina and being taken to iraq right where he was prison in prison for so many years as we read in a hole in the ground right and so many times they tried to kill him but his jailers refused to kill him because of his piety piety they saw how pious he was they they, they couldn't take it themselves yeah. or bring themselves Versus to kill him kingdom. so i mean the imam had such a charismatic a, sort a of charismatic magic. light that even his most avowed enemies couldn't bring themselves to kill him until Sindhi, until the end and in this even in this historical circumstance we see the imam still found opportunities to teach the deen and an example being during this historical period in the city of baghdad the imam was imprisoned by sindhi bin shahik may allah's curse Person. be upon him yeah. and it was during this time that his jailer had a son that son had a tutor that would visit that tutor was by, went by the name of Abu Umran al-Mirwazi. This tutor was actually a Shia of Imam al-Kadhim. Interesting. And he would take, after he finishes teaching the, 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 the child, he would go to secretly meet with the Imam. Do we have uh, any sort of uh, historical evidence on this? Like any body of hadith or literature, any manuscripts uh, that uh, is proof to what you just presented? Because that's a very, very interesting fact. Yes, in fact, um, the late Ayatollah Sayyid Muhammad Hussein al-Jalali, my <laughs> teacher who passed away, uh, may Allah uh, raise his rank, he found a manuscript in the 1960s in Damascus, in Maktab al in Dimashq, a manuscript entitled Musnad al-Imam Musa ibn Ja'far, which is Musnad meaning the ahadith that go back to Imam al-Kadhim right? They're connected to Imam al-Kadhim. And this book has been narrated by this Mirwazi fellow. It was Mirwazi who is discussed in the Rijal of Najashi and Tusi as being a companion of the seventh imam and he had a book but this book was lost mm -hmm. for centuries until it was found by the late sayyid muhammad hussein al hussein al jalali in the city of damascus interestingly enough preserved in the library of the shafi'is and the hanbalis of all oh. people yes yeah. the hanabila and the shafi'iyya were the ones who preserved this book which again shows us that the seventh imam alayhi salam al imam al kadhim alayhi salam his personality and and knowledge was beyond description every nobody could debate that these ahadith were important whether they believe him to be ma'asum or not ma'asum is a separate issue but he was nevertheless an extremely important character, extremely important personality of Islam. And this book was found in the city of Damascus. It's a manuscript with various chains of transmission going back to Al-Mirwazi. And it was Al-Mirwazi that narrated these traditions from Imam Al-Kadhim and it's Imam Al-Kadhim that narrates it going back to Amir Al-Mu'minin or to the Prophet himself. So it goes from Mirwazi who's narrating from Imam Al-Kadhim, from the seventh Imam who's narrating from his grandfathers, either so, Amir al-Mu'mineen or the Prophet himself. So think of the Sana, this Imam al-Kadhim narrating exactly. from Imam to Imam to Imam, right? Beginning with al-Mirwazi narrating from him. So it was al-Mirwazi that compiled these traditions together. There are about 53 or so ahadith, um, and it became a book. And it's one of the relics and archaeological treasures, treasures. Of, the, of the history of Islam and the Madhab of Ahlul Bayt, which was discovered only about what 50 years ago or so, 50, 60 years ago, it was discovered. Um, now it's mentioned in our books, such as the Fihrist of Tusi, the Rijal of Najashi, but we did not have the book. 
and then it was found. All praise is due Allah. Uh, if you agree, let's uh, turn to, uh, I think, an important topic. Uh, you just uh, mentioned, uh, well, Harun al-Abbasi, may the curse and wrath of Allah be upon him. Uh, we see that at the beginning of his reign, uh, this, this narration has been reflected both in the, the Shia sources and the uh, Sunni sources, that uh, one of the visits that the Imam made to, of course, was made uh, to, you know, or uh, by himself decided to, that uh, in which uh, Harun al-Abbasi shows extreme uh, let's say, respect towards the Imam and treats him with, uh, let's say, utmost reverence. And uh, even, uh, you know, he just embraces the Imam, hugs the Imam. And this is such a surprise to his son, Ma'mun, standing there being witness to this. And uh, he himself, Ma'mun, later on, says that the, the first, uh, let's say, inclination, or if you like it, uh, in me uh, towards Ahl Bayt was, you know, just born there in my heart. And, and what sort of circumstances, uh, historical, political, and social circumstances, uh, let's say, rendered uh, Harun al-Abbasi, he was, of course, a tyrant, Definitely, he was, uh, 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 we can say, a callous murderer or whatever uh, you may call him and describe him. But uh, we see that there is, uh, if we you know, look closely at his treatment, uh, there was, a, there was a, a dramatic shift of strategy at the beginning of his reign. Uh, you know, the, the imamate of Imam Qadim, Aysam, if I'm not mistaken, spent 35 years. So it's only 14 years uh, of her, uh, in prison, or even maybe shorter, according to some reports. But uh, what happened really? Was it the, the, the Shiites not really fulfilling what they were supposed to? Even the uh, descendants of uh, the, the, I can say, prophet, I mean, some family members uh, uh, from descendants of Imam Hassan alayhi salam, the, the brothers of Imam Qadim alayhi salam, some of the, the uh, riots that they unfortunately led, uh, or was it what that just uh, affected this shift mm. in the, the, the treatment of uh, Harun al-Abbasi towards the Imam? You know, you bring up a very important question because, uh, yeah. so, I'm sorry, it's so relevant to our time and, and our treatment of our imam and what is our duty towards our imam. Sorry. Yeah, I think, first of all, as far as Harun's treatment of the, of the imam, all of the, or not all, but most of the Abbasid khalafa could not always overtly hate the imam. Mm -hmm. That was still a bridge to cross, too far to cross. I think we have to understand that Imam al Qadim was loved. Imam al Qadim was Imam al Muslimin. Not only Imam for the Shia. That's the point. Imam al Muslimin. He was not somebody that you could just lock up and throw away the key and curse. Harun had no choice at times but to pretend mm -hmm. that he loves Imam, just like Mahmoud. Now, they would have to come up with pretexts, such as, uh, you know, they would try to find people in the Imam's circle that are leading a revolt against the Abbasids. They had to find, they were grabbing at straws mm -hmm. to try to find a pretext to say that the Imam is a rebel. Mm -hmm. It was never the Imam himself. We have to understand exactly. that. It was the people around the Imam at times that were not following the guidance of the Imam the that point. put the Imam into jeopardy. Yes. That put the, and even some of his good companions yes. who made mistakes and then later had to repent because of this. Um, and, and the riwayat are very well known about this. It's not to say that we reject their hadith or they're bad people. 
It's just that in a difficult situation like that, some of the companions had to, you know, some of the companions spoke a little bit very openly mm -hmm. about the imamat. And that actually put the imam, could put the imam into jeopardy. So Harun, like later Abbasid Khulafa as well, had no choice at times. I think Mutawakkil may be the exception. Yeah. Uh, to occasionally show a degree of false or hypocritical love towards the Imams alayhim salam. Again, brother, we have to understand these are Imam Aimmatul Muslimin. These are people whose respect and taqwa and ilm and wara and godliness is not disputed by any Muslim. You c they could not 100% of the time, 24-7, be overtly um, acrimonious towards mm -hmm. the imams. They had to play this game of politics. Just like why would, they would, why would for example, um, um Fadl be wed to Imam al-Jawad? Why? I mean, why, right? I mean, they're trying to show uh, this false sense of connection with the Ahlul Bayt. And the companions around the Imam had to understand this. For example, Ali ibn Yaqteen, a famous companion of the seventh yeah. Imam, had a very close relationship with Harun. And he lived a life of deep taqiyya, of deep dissimulation. In a riwayah, Ibn Shahrashub narrates in his manaqib, Ali ibn Yaqteen wrote a letter to Imam al kadhim asking the Imam about the details of wudu, to which the Imam writes back to him, telling Ali ibn Yaqteen to wash his ears. Ali ibn Yaqteen is reading this and saying, there is no, this is not the, the wudu of Ahlul Bayt. And then he real, then it was explained to him by the Imam that a time will come where you will have to perform wudu like this, or rather, rather the Imam did not explain it, but Ali ibn Yaqteen realized, realized later it. on that Harun was spying, spying on, on Ali ibn Yaqteen with yeah. the suspicion that he was a follower of Imam al-Kadhim. And if he performed the wudu according to the school of Ahlul Bayt, he would be outed as a Shia. And lo and behold, there was a day when Ali ibn Yaqteen was being spied on by Harun. And when Harun saw him performing the wudu in this way, it clarified for him that Ali ibn Yaqteen, supposedly, according to Harun, was not a follower of Imam al kadhim alayhi salam. This is an example of taqiyya, because people's heads would be cut off. Harun and the Abbasids, according to many narrations, had executioners on standby. If you said one word that the, that the, that the caliph did not like, they would cut your head off right there. On the not only that, these people were the, some of the most sick and demented psychopathic killers that have ever walked the earth. Um, and and, and I, I really mean that. They are as complete sociopaths and psychopaths. And not to mention that, these people did some of the most disgusting behavior in private, which no need to talk about what this behavior yeah. is, but the most lewd uh, fawahish yeah, yeah. that you could think of. They thought of themselves more as Sasanian or Zoroastrian kings than they did as Khulafa al Muslimin. This term, Khalifatul Muslimin or Khalifatullah, whichever one they use, is just a useless title for them. They saw themselves as sovereigns. Exactly. They saw themselves as kings. And the environment of fear, of repression, of killing and of murder was towards anybody who would have the least in inkling or, or, or ideology that would be different from them. Because these sovereigns were so insecure in themselves so that they demanded this sort of obedience from the people. Naturally now, a person like Musa ibn Ja'far Bab al Hawaj, Al Imam al Kadim alayhi salam would become enemy number one to them. And Ali ibn Yaqteen, and Hisham, and whoever else formed the circle of the Imam. And the greatest example that we have is Dua Joshin al Sagir.
yeah, this is it is really a, a treasure and full of uh, lofty and sublime expressions that are so thought provoking and, and spiritually uplifting uh, the du'a that you just mentioned. And more importantly, or not more importantly, equally important is the story behind du'a Joshin. I think Mu'minin should know the story behind this du'a, the riwaya. Firstly, first point about du'a Joshin Sahir, and I discussed this in my doctoral dissertation at length. It is one of the most authentic du'as that we have. It's narrated through multiple ulama who have in fact given ijazat and licenses to each other in order to narrate this du'a. It is described by Arab Zurk at Tehrani, Rahmatullahi ta'ala alayh, the great muhaddith and scholar of, of, of Islamic literature of the city of Najaf, describes this du'a as essentially being, you know, having a golden sanad, a golden chain of transmission. That's one point. We don't have time to go into all of its details, but needless to say, this du'a was a cornerstone of Islamic teachings from at least, in documented form, at least a thousand years. That we have examples where the great ulama like Sheikh Tusi or his son would teach the du'a to their students in the city of Najaf near the Haram of Amir al-Mu'mineen, near the Dari of Amir al-Mu'mineen. These are maraja, these are ulama, who are specialists in fiqh, specialists in theology, who are taking the time out to teach du'a joshin saghir to their students. And we have the archaeological written records of this. So it highlights its importance, oh, obviously. It's, it is probably the most, one of the most important du'as of the Shia literature. Exactly. Now, the narration behind it. The narration states, as, ne as if recorded, could just, uh, yeah. keep it brief. Yeah, basically yeah. what the narration states is that when the companions would come to the Imam, they would hide the, the tablets yes. in their sleeves and they would record everything that the Imam said. And this is one of the supplications that they recorded of where the Imam talks about the feeling of being attacked, of being surrounded by his enemies. And he turns to Allah with his weakness, meaning in front of Allah, everyone is weak and he seeks the help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Thank you. Uh, Sheikh Ma, if you agree, we could conclude uh, this uh, episode with uh, one of the greatest miracles that you can think of and, uh, you know, just share with the viewers uh, from his lifetime or uh, something that people visiting his shrine uh, just uh, witnessed. I don't know if this is the greatest miracle, but it is a miracle that is narrated in our lifetime, or at least close to our lifetime, by a scholar uh, by the name of Sayyid Muhammad Qadim al-Qazwini. He was a scholar of the city of Karbala. And the story of his birth is very interesting. Basically, he uh, was the last of his sons, of the children to be born. All of his brothers before had died. His father went to the haram of Imam al-Qadim. And they're from the descendants of Imam al Kadim. Imagine all the boys had died before him. How Allah plans it. All the boys died before him. And the father went to the haram of Imam al Kadim and asked for a son. And it was at that last son that survived. And his name was Muhammad Kadim. And he then became someone who was known to perform miracles in his own lifetime. Be barakat Bab al Hawaij. With the blessings of Bab al Hawaij, Imam al Kadim. <laughs> Thank you very much. It was uh, such a fascinating discussion with you. And I hope that the viewers all enjoyed this discussion. Inshallah, we will be with you on the following nights and we'll have uh, interesting discussions. And I would like to thank uh, all of the viewers who uh, stayed with us until uh, this moment. And you can stay tuned with Imam Hussein TV for the next program to come. Welcome to Karbala. Uh, thank you and uh, for watching this program and spending time with us. Goodbye to you all. <laughs>